Hi, good afternoon. I know I'm holding you from your lunch, so let's start. So I just quickly want to say who Cloudflare is. So we are a con uh, content distribution network. Um, we're also a security company. So you can see here on this diagram, we sit in front of websites. We make them faster, more secure, and more stable. And we do that by filtering out bad traffic. Um, so we work at the network level. Um, we have a lot of POPs around the world. And we're growing more, especially in this region where we're adding a few more POPs over the next uh, 12 to 24 months. Um, we also have an IPv6 gateway, which is something very useful for people in the region. We, if your um, web server, so if, let's say you've run out of IPv4 addresses, you only have an IPv6 address, um, you can use our CDN and you'll get an IPv4 address on our CDN so that the IPv4 internet can still use your service. And we offer this for free with our CDN. So I'm going to start about our Anycast CDN. Um, it's how we use the, it's the technology that we use to distribute our network um, for, for the CDN purposes. So with Anycast, it's important you, you announce the same IP address from every one of your sites. So currently we have 24 sites around the world and more on the way, and we're announcing the same IP addresses from every one of these sites. You're all familiar with this, with how the root servers work. It's important to note, though, that we don't use any unicast addresses, so standard what people would normally use for their broadband in content delivery. It is all anycast based. Um, we do use unicast to pull traffic from origin servers. It's something Arato mentioned earlier. But this is how we get content into the node, and then we use anycast to serve to ISPs. So with the anycast network, the traffic is controlled by the BGP routing tables. So if an ISP routes to us in Chile, we will serve the content back from Chile. Um, in, the, in the case on here, I said if we serve it from Hong Kong, if an ISP routes to us in Hong Kong, we reply from Hong Kong and serve the traffic from there. I have an example here. Um, it may be a little small on the screen, but you can see that there is a trace route to the same IP address. In the top uh, example, it's coming from Singapore, and it's going to a Singapore node, and that's around one millisecond away. In the bottom example, there's a trace route coming from Peru, and it's going to our node in Valparaiso in Chile, and that's around 30 milliseconds. So you can see we're using the same IP address, but the latency is very different. So you can see there's unique instances of that IP address running in different locations. So th this is critical to how the Anycast traffic works. So as an animated diagram, what will happen is uh, there's a DNS query against your ISP's DNS server. The ISP's DNS server will query the closest one of our nodes, again, using an Anycast address to reach that. Um, it'll get a reply, and that reply will then go back to the user. The user then will try and open a connection, um, and that opens the connection to the closest one of our nodes, and we reply back to the user. In the event of a failure, there's no need to do new DNS lookups. There's no need for failover, because that, that node fails out of BGP. It's no longer announcing BGP routes anymore. And the traffic will be redirected to the next, lo next closest location. And this all happens within milliseconds or seconds inside the BGP routing table. So, Connectivity is a really important thing, especially when you're running an Anycast node. Um, in the APAC region, um, some people have done research into the, the root server's connectivity. And you could find that a provider in, uh, sorry, one of the root nodes in Australia was using an Indian transit provider for connectivity. And what that meant was that connect, uh, queries to that root server from India were going all the way to Australia. And that gave very poor performance. So it's really important to pick the right, the right carrier to, to your needs for any cast traffic. Um, globally, we, we've picked a small number of carriers which we use. So we use three carriers in the US and European Union. Um, we use three carriers across Asia. And in Latin America, we're just using one carrier at the moment. Using a single provider makes routing really, really easy because you can work out where they interconnect with every one of their peers, and you can influence that quite well. Once you introduce more than one carrier, it becomes difficult to manipulate the traffic. You need to understand how both carriers are interconnected and how you're balancing your traffic. 
It's really important that your transit providers give you good routing controls. It's really important to have good communities um, and a good relationship with that carrier so you can understand how you can manipulate traffic. Um, one of the important things is you want to be able to keep traffic within a region. Against our Asian carriers, the routes that we announce to them, they don't go outside of Asia. So we make sure that at their borders, they filter it going to the US or to Europe. Um, it's also very important that your transit providers make use of hot potato routing so that they always exit at the closest mutual point with their peers because you don't want traffic going from, uh, from Santiago up to Los Angeles to Miami then back to Sao Paulo. You want to exchange it in Santiago. So transit regionally is a little bit different um, and each region is a little bit different as well. Um, we have domestic relationships with some of the larger carriers um, to assist in that region. This is largely because of some routing issues, so you may be using a large global carrier for connectivity, but they're not well connected in one of the countries that, that you're using the service from them, so you need to supplement that. Capacity can also be an issue. The, the large global carriers may not have enough connectivity to the eyeball networks that you want to send to. So quite often you do need to go and get extra connectivity on top of that. But again, it's also really important to make sure that your route announcements are isolated so that they don't leak outside of that extra, extra carrier you're bringing in. So routing controls are a critical thing that when you're running any cast, you must understand and you must use them. Um, it's very likely that a customer of your European transit provider is likely to be a peer of your Asian transit provider. So if you're not careful and you announce those routes there, you're going to have traffic shifting all over the world and that's not what you want to happen. Um, there's some example communities available from that link on there, the onesec.net. Um, this is from some of the larger tier one carriers um, giving examples of their community controls which you can use. Um, when you're connecting to a new carrier, it's really important that you go through pre-sales with them and understand what their expectations are and what your expectations are of how you want to be able to control the traffic. As an example, if you do a lookup of AS1299, which is Telia Sonara, their Whois entry against the RIPE database, you'll be able to see they have community controls listed in remarks there. And with those controls, you're able to influence traffic routing. In Latin America, Things are a bit different. There's not too many regional carriers which you can use to well connect to every ISP in the region. We're currently connecting using Telefonica, but there's some gaps. Um, if we only connected to level three or global crossing, there would also be some gaps there. So it's a difficult choice in what you need to do in the region. And there's a lot of work which needs to be done to help improve that. So, with peering, so a lot of people say peering is great, it's economical, sorry. Um, in the US, is it economic to peer? This is something which is coming up if you go to an analog meeting, a lot of people will be saying, no, it's not economical to peer anymore as, a, as a, when you're doing a large amount of traffic because the transit prices have gotten so low. It, you're going to get transit for less than a dollar still from good providers, so it doesn't make sense to connect to that internet exchange. And when you're delivering content, most of the providers in, in North America won't actually peer with you. So if you're trying to send to Comcast, to AT&T, to Time Warner Cable or Verizon, as well as others, you're going to have difficulty actually getting connectivity to them f at settlement free. There are some good things happening in North America though. There is the OpenIX and other peering expansions happening. So these are good initiatives which are helping expand peering and hopefully going to help the North American market. In the European Union, it's also very similar in, the, in Europe. There is the same argument as the US. The transit prices have dropped a lot. Um, many more networks though in, in Europe are open to peering. So, as, as in Europe over the US, we have a much higher peering ratio because a lot of those networks are, are more open to peering. Like the AMP6 guys have done a great job in opening up that market very well. But the same problem is there that most of the late larger incumbent carriers won't actually peer. 
Um, in Asia, which is where I was working previously, it's very economical to peer, where transit is still in the tens of dollars in some cases. So connecting to an internet exchange is, is great value. Some of the internet exchanges as well, with the example of the Hong Kong Internet Exchange, have 100% of the country on the internet exchange. This is great. I don't think there's many other exchanges in the world that are like this. So by connecting to Hong Kong Internet Exchange, you get all of Hong Kong as well as parts of other parts of the region. But when we look at Latin America and as an outsider looking at PeeringDB, PeeringDB is the, the best source of information that we have when we're looking at the world holistically. You can see that Cabase is doing quite well. They have a fair number of participants listed. When we look in Chile, it shows three participants connected to NAP of the Chile. Um, when we look in Colombia, you can see there's two internet exchanges, but there's only four on one and zero on another. So there's a big gap there, and, and this sort of information needs to be shared better so networks coming in can know what to expect, and as well as to help with peering in the region. It's really important to do that. Another big problem that we see here is carrier neutral data centers. There's not many in the region at all. And not having a, not having a carrier neutral data center is a, uh, it's a stopper against peering because the single carriers which own that facility will then block access to other carriers. Having a neutral building means that anyone can interconnect with anyone and it opens up that landscape. So this is why peering has been so successful in North America, in Europe and in Asia. So there are a lot of challenges that we've discovered once we've started deploying here in, in Latin America. Um, this is the graph on the bottom is looking at our traffic from our node in Chile through Telefonica to all the networks in Chile. Um, we see 510 unique AS paths um, from Telefonica to us. Um, out of these, there are only a few which we see directly connected to ISPs. So you can see a, a large amount of the AS paths is connecting via the US to reach networks in Chile. That doesn't make sense. There's no reason why that traffic should trombone. When we look at AS22047, again from our view in, in, um, in Valparaiso, we see that there are four unique paths. There's going via Telefonica and also going via Level 3 or Global Crossing. This is likely done because of traffic control. The ISP wants to make sure that their traffic is balanced between both upstreams. But it's not an effective way to do it because it means that one of the transit carriers only sees half of your traffic. So anyone who's only connected to that carrier can't see the other half of your traffic and has to go back to the US to reach it. There are much, much smarter ways that this can be done. And I want to expand on this a little bit. So it, it's really an education thing. I've mentioned several times in this talk that BGP communities are a great thing to use. So if you're worried about too much traffic coming in on Telefonica, which is why you haven't announced all your routes to them, there are ways that you can stop that. So if you don't want to get um, traffic, say, from, uh, let's say, from Verizon in North America to come in on your Telefonica path, there is a community you can use to announce to Telefonica to prepend or to not announce that route at all. Doing this will mean that the traffic will shift to your other transit provider. So that's a way that you can balance your traffic. A lot of the networks as well prepend, and prepending is, is easy to do and it has an immediate effect to your traffic flows, but it's not always effective. It can sometimes mean that you prepend 10 times and you still don't remove the traffic because of customer relationships and because of peering. So BGP communities are the way to go. Selective announcements to your transit providers are bad. They're not a good thing to be doing. I've shown an example from one of our configuration snippets. So here we're using a community. I haven't shown the community themselves. You'll, you'll need to ask Telefonica for their community set. Um, but this one is setting the local preference to 85. There's the first one there. Setting this, um, and in this case, it's marking it the same as a Telefonica peer. So if, if we send a route to Telefonica, and Telefonica also sees that from another path, one of their peers, let's say Verizon, it sees with equal weight, so it then goes to AS path lengths or metrics or other values. So this is a good way that you can balance traffic. There is also, like I said there, there's the no advertise. So using this community, any route that we tag with that community then won't be advertised to that provider. It will still go to other providers, but it's a way to restrict the traffic. It's very important when you're using no advertised communities to make sure you understand the impacts. 
If you don't advertise a route between tier ones, you may not be reachable to parts of the internet. Um, as I also showed there, there's the AS path prepend as a way, as a very crude way to balance traffic. Do we have any questions? Alguna pregunta? Creo que tienen hambre. <laughs> eh, bueno, en vista del tiempo, pues eh, muchas gracias, Tom. Eh, cualquier pregunta, Tom está todavía presente aquí. Eh, eh, muchas gracias, un aplauso para Tom. Hay mucho trabajo todavía aquí.